Welcome. Be sure to like and subscribe for more scary stories. Story number one. Hello, is anyone there? Can anyone hear me? I've been here for a really long time. I haven't eaten or drank in a long time. Oh my god. Oh my god. He's here. I think he's gonna kill me. Mom, Dad, if you're watching this, please know that I love you. I was awoken from the traumatic imagery of my lucid dreams. The dreams reoccur almost every day and involve the same girl who constantly pleads for help. I've since taken medication prescribed by my doctor, but I don't think any amount consumed could help relieve the trauma. I used to do school full time, but dropped out as my work hours and personal life became too overwhelming. My lack of sleep and countless hours on the internet would literally start to take over my life. I had recently started ingesting beer mixed with under-the-counter sleeping pills just before bed as it would help knock me unconscious till my next work shift. Besides, my time being consumed through sleep or work, I had gradually grown an obsession with the deep web since the disappearance of my classmate Cindy. Her disappearance had become a cold case, despite any testimonies and evidence given to the police. It was rumored that she was kidnapped and trafficked on the dark web, but that's not even the worst part about it. I came home from work one night and discovered a disturbing photograph lying within my mail slot. The photo was titled Doll Number 21. It was an image of Cindy, except she had her arms and legs missing. I've consistently dug down the rabbit hole since, and even got my school colleague Eric to chime in. If I had to be honest, I didn't look at Eric as much of a friend, but more as a fellow computer geek. I can't say that being friends with an internet warlock of his magnitude was a bad thing, but at the end of the day, it was all just an act. My suspicions regarding Eric's involvement in Cindy's disappearance had grown substantially since the last video chat I had with him. It began with some casual small talk to us sharing internet conspiracy theories and then eventually him disclosing some images from the dark web. Hey, Terence, wanna see something cool, dude? I'm not in the mood for that right now. Oh, come on, stop being a wimp. I'm not trying to go missing on a milk carton, bro, like Cindy. That's not funny, dude. His repulsive laughter made his face look like a live Disney character, but at the same time, it gave off an uncanny atmosphere. I couldn't help but address the elephant in the room. So I said, dude, can I ask you something? What do you want? Do you, by any chance, know where Cindy is? Like, where is she? Why the hell are you bringing her up? Let her rest in peace, goddammit. Dude, she's not dead. Don't you remember? I was the one that found the doll 21 pick in my mail slot. You mean pictures like these? Dude, where the hell did you get those? Where do you think I got them, idiots? My persistence and relentlessness wouldn't allow Eric to get off the hook that easily. So I continued to egg him on by saying stuff like, Dude, please, you have to help me find Cindy. A few seconds later, Eric sent a message saying click this with a link right next to it. My heart began pacing harder and harder. I immediately assumed that the link had something to do with Cindy. I began to slowly move my mouse cursor towards the URL when Eric says, Click the link now. I responded with, What the hell is your problem? Hurry up and click the link already. I couldn't help but leave a few question marks in the chat, as I was genuinely confused and hesitant to click the link. Click the link or else, dude. What are you sending me? If you don't click the link now, all bets are off. Stop frightening me. Then click the fucking link. I didn't know if he was playing a prank or not, but I knew I had to be careful with him. 
He was definitely the type that could hack my computer at will. Again, I shifted my cursor towards the URL, when Eric suddenly began to spam my chat box with the same length over and over again. It was almost as if his keyboard had jammed. I felt the sense of claustrophobia rained down my surroundings as I began to smash my keyboard only to miraculously open the URL and see a meme face with the word gotcha written above it. Unfortunately, that wasn't going to be the last interaction I had with Eric. One night, Eric invited me over for the usual bit of surfing the web. We watched over a dozen snuff films that he archived on his desktop while getting plastered with some beers I brought over. The more we slammed back our beers, the more the night started transitioning to a foggy blur. I saw Eric gradually roll his eyes to the back of his head and pass out cold on his chair. Good thing my under-the-counter sleeping pills came in handy for this occasion. I frantically began going through his computer files, trying to find anything related to doll number 21, or, should I say, Cindy. That's when I discovered about 20 to 30 folders titled doll number, along with the correlating digit. I selected a random video from one of the folders and witnessed one of the most disturbing snuff films I've ever laid eyes on. It was a video of a woman swinging back and forth on a swing, except she had no arms and legs, just like Cindy. The sight was what I can only describe as inhumane. I couldn't comprehend how one could find so much pleasure inflicting harm to someone else on camera. I saw the woman babbling some sort of gibberish when a man wearing a pig mask appeared under the camera shot. He forcefully grabbed the woman's face while saying, repeat after me. They want to return home to the master's suite, where the world is divine and the dolls are beautiful. I can't hear you. My heart felt like it was going to drop to my stomach. The poor lady's face literally toppled over her chest. I immediately clicked off the link and began to further stroll around her X-Files. I opened the doll number 21 folder and saw hundreds of MP4 files of Cindy and that man, the Pigman. I'll never forget the excruciating agony he put that poor girl through. Do you have any idea the pain and misery you put me through, do you? Oh, my legs, to get to this very moment, the moment we must cherish. Those like you don't come around very often, you know. Please, I just want to go home. You're home now. Say it. I sat there in disgust. There was no way I could stomach the atrocity I just witnessed but the next clip was the one that took all the marbles. It was a video of Cindy, except it looked identical to my recurring dreams. The dreams I see every night just before going to sleep, or should I say, nightmares. Hello, is anyone there? Can anyone hear me? I've been here for a really long time. I haven't eaten or drank in a long time. Oh my God, oh my God. He's here. I think he's gonna kill me. Mom, Dad, if you're watching this, please know that I love you. God, please help me. God has nothing to do with this. Story number two. I wasn't careful enough on the deep web. The deep web is one of the most amazing things on Earth. Not because of how joyful it makes people or anything but because it is a completely uncensored view of people. You can speak your minds, buy what you want, do anything you want. When on the deep web, you have complete and total freedom. I had always been fascinated by the deep web, and at the time the events in this story occurred, I was in college. Lots of people at my campus had been really getting into accessing the deep web. It was almost like a trend, with so many people getting on it. It seemed perfectly safe for me to give it a try. I mean, why not? Now, I had always heard of the deep web horror stories. Stories of hacking. 
stumbling on disgusting sights, and even people somehow finding your address. These stories were mainly what kept me off the deep web, but with most of the people at my college using it on a normal basis, I decided to give it a go. I asked a friend to come over and help me set it up. When my friend arrived, we opened up my laptop and began to set everything up. He told me that we were using Tor, a program that lets you access the deep web. He also asked me if I was planning on doing anything illegal, to which I replied, no. He said that since I wasn't, we did need to install Tails, which is apparently a software that makes it more secure if you plan on doing illegal things. A little while later, everything was set up. I had my new IP address, and my friend gave me a brief rundown of what to do and what not to do. He made it very clear that when I was using the hidden wiki, I should keep it on sensor mode so that it would be less likely for me to see something I didn't want to see. After about two weeks of using the deep web, I felt like a pro. I'd accessed many different sites, spoken with some great people, made friends. I became cocky and was ready to dig deeper into the dark web. I turned off the censored mode on the hidden wiki and began to browse the links. It took a while, mostly because Tor is a bit slow and many of the links just led to dead web pages. Eventually, I stumbled on a chat room called All the Gore. It was mainly a big chat room with many different topics. I had a fairly strong stomach. I'd seen many violent movies and had seen beheadings, killings, etc. Though through the normal internet, after looking at a few different chat rooms, I noticed how sick this site really was. The people in this chat room were actually killers, bragging about some of the things they had done. In the chat room, you could also post pictures. One man by the name of Culture 45 had the stage in one of the chat rooms. He was explaining in detail how he had broken into someone's house, kidnapped a little girl, and brutally killed her parents by hiding under their bed and then opening their throats. He then explained how he brought the little girl back to his house and cut her up. I didn't think he was telling the truth at first, but then he posted pictures. They were the most horrifying pictures I had ever seen. The new ones were of the girl tied to a chair, bleeding, crying, throwing up, etc. Then he showed a picture of him with a drill. The most haunting part of that was while he was doing it. He was looking at the camera with sheer joy on his face. I'd seen enough and typed in the chat room window, you people are sick and deserve to die. How can you sleep at night? Immediately, people began making fun of me, saying that I was just as helpless and ignorant as the little girl in the pictures and that I should get off the big boy part of the internet. They started calling me a bitch and an empath. When Culture 45 typed something in the chat box, he said, Really? Where do you live, buddy? I'm sure everybody would love to see you on this site. I think I made the biggest mistake of my life, and I typed, I'm calling the police, and I'm gonna have this site shut the fuck down. Less than a minute later, everything on the site went black, and a new chat box appeared in green. In it, someone named Admin1 typed in the box. He said, call the cops, and you will regret it. I didn't type anything in the box and reached for my cell phone. What happened next? haunts me to this day. My phone said I had a new message. I opened it, and it said, call the police, and you're dead. There was no number. It didn't even say unknown number. It was just blank. I looked back at my laptop and saw my webcam light turn on. I quickly covered it, but saw on the screen a picture of me looking at my phone. I got wide-eyed and froze for a moment when the admin typed again. Put the phone down right now and uncover your webcam. I put my phone down, but kept the webcam covered. When he typed again, okay, then be like that. 
right after he posted my full name and address in the chat box and typed, it will be a shame if you and your college buddies went missing, wouldn't it? He said. I then did as he said and uncovered my webcam. He then told me to follow his instructions on how to make it impossible for me to reach the site again. I followed each and every one. When I finished, I got a text that said, Now, don't ever try to come back. Just like before, it had no number. I still called the police for my friend's phone, but they were never able to find the site. If you ever go on the deep web, don't ever just mindlessly explore. Especially if you don't have additional software to keep you more secure. I was a stupid college kid, and I just hope nobody makes the same mistakes I did. I moved to a different home, and changed all of my information, but I still get nightmares to this day. Profoundly rattled by what had happened, the police tried to track down the website, but since there was no way for them to recover my history, and I'd originally found the site by just randomly clicking links, it seemed pretty hopeless to find it. The police told me to change all my information about myself and to move in with a friend. After changing pretty much all of my information, I decided to move in with my friend David. David was an extremely hardworking and honest person. He never went to parties, slacked off, got drunk or high. He was just really dedicated to finishing college. In fact, he was one of the few kids I knew at the time who wasn't getting on the deep web regularly. I had told him all about my experience with the deep web, and that's mostly why he agreed to let me stay with him. One night, we were both up studying very late when my phone went off. I looked up to see who had texted me, and I saw that the person sending the message had no number, just like last time. It read, check your computer. There was nothing else to it, just one simple instruction. I opened my laptop, and when I did, I noticed that I didn't have control of the mouse. I tried to move it, but the mouse had just moved on its own. Someone had remote access to my computer, somehow. I never gave anyone remote access before. I tried a whole bunch of keyboard commands, but not a single one worked. I noticed that whoever had control of my laptop was downloading software, most likely malware, but there was nothing I could do. I heard my phone go off again, and this time, the message said, Look out your window. I didn't know which window the guy was referring to, so I looked out the one I was sitting by and saw a man in the parking lot leaning up against a white van. He had a phone in his hands, and when I looked at him, he nodded. My phone went off again. Type in and hold down Shift plus Alt plus F5 at the same time to activate the software. I called David to my room to show him what was going on. He seemed just as nervous as I was. We didn't want to anger him. David called the police right away and told me that they would be there soon. I didn't activate the software and just sat there. Eventually, I got another text. I am coming in. If you don't do it right now, I don't know why he or the person in control of my computer couldn't do it, but I didn't dare to ask. At the same time though, I was 99% sure that this program had malware or spyware or something that was very harmful to my computer, so I refused to activate it. David grabbed the baseball bat just in case the man outside tried to come in. About five minutes later, we heard the doorknob turning. It was locked, but we then heard banging at the door. We both freaked out and looked out the window again. Sure enough, the man in the van was gone. The banging on the door got more and more violent until eventually we heard a horrible scratching sound. It lasted a few minutes, and then we heard footsteps walk down the hall and eventually fade away. I received another text. We will be back. That really got to me. When the cops arrived, they told me to look at my door. I followed them back out into the hallway and saw engraved in our door my name. 
The police began investigating the whole building, and they had a tech police officer come in and look at my computer. He began to do scans and investigate the weird software on my laptop. Eventually, he managed to close and remove it, and told me that my laptop isn't safe. He said that the core files had been hacked into or corrupted. The next day, I had just gotten home from school and was really tired. David wasn't home yet, so I went to my room and fell into bed. I had just begun to close my eyes when I heard a rattling sound in my closet. I lifted my head up and didn't hear it again, so I went back to sleep. After a few minutes, the closet door swung open. I leaped out of bed and saw a man with a mask walking over to me. I ran for the door and slammed it behind me. I ran out to the parking lot, started my car, and drove away as fast as I could. By the time the police had arrived, the man was, of course, gone. The apartment surprisingly had not been wrecked or anything. We didn't even find anything stolen. He didn't seem to do anything at first. This night, two police officers were monitoring everyone who came in or out of the building to catch the man. I opened my laptop and noticed that my wallpaper had changed. It was just a bunch of trees, but it had been changed to a sickening photo of a man with a mask. The same mask that I saw on the man who was in my closet, digging a knife into a man in what looked like a small cabin. I also noticed that all of my applications and programs were gone, and I saw the same software as last time, right in the middle. I clicked on it and it had already been installed, just like last time. It filled the entire screen, and it looked like a live stream was going on. I couldn't exit out, and the live stream was coming from a boy's house. He looked about 13 or 14. As I watched, I saw that the closet door behind the poor boy slowly opened, and a man walked out with a toolbox in one hand. He quietly set the toolbox down and pulled out some duct tape he went behind the kid and put the tape over his mouth and grabbed him tight. The poor kid's face was in total fear. He tried to scream, but he couldn't because of the tape. They were making a decent amount of noise, so it told me that the kid must have been home alone. I tried hard to exit out, but I couldn't. I then saw the man take out a screwdriver, drive it into the kid's chest. Blood began to pour out and the kid made a full wheezing type noise. I saw tears come from his eyes, and the sick man began to drive the screwdriver deeper and deeper. Then he yanked it out. The man then took out a hammer and smashed the kid's hand several times until they were nothing more than a mangled, bloody mess. I tried every command I could to exit out, but nothing was working. I noticed that in the chat box, Several people were cheering the man on and requesting for him to do different things to the boy. The man then took out a handheld electric saw, pressed it against the boy's face, and turned it on. The boy screamed with pain as the saw went up into his eye, causing blood to go everywhere and even get on the camera a little. Then the man took the screwdriver, gouged out the kid's eyes, and took out a large knife. He proceeded to slit the boy's throat and tossed him on the ground. I was sick. I threw up all over the floor, and when I looked back, I saw the chat box people typing in horrible things like fap bap pop or oh my god. That was so wonderful. Thanks so much for doing this, etc. In the box, I saw someone named Culture, 45 type. Thanks for watching, John. After that, the program closed on its own, and I was left with the sickening wallpaper. I was sweating, breathing heavily and feeling sick. Throughout the entire thing, I didn't realize that my phone had gone off several times. I looked at it, and the most hateful, mean messages were coming from my friends and family. I asked my mom what was wrong and she texted back that she was sent that sick, disturbing live stream to everyone. John, I can't believe who you are. I called the police on you, John. I felt even more sick than before. 
Those monsters had sent the live streams to all my friends somehow and made it come from me. They had pretty much ruined my life within a couple of minutes. When the police arrived, I told them everything that had happened, and quickly they managed to explain to all my friends and family what happened. They really cracked down on finding these people, and about a month later, four men had been arrested. One was Culture 45, the other was Admin 1, and the two others were working with them. The site was found and shut down as well, and I got a new laptop and phone. I could say some horror cliché here, and say something like I kept getting texts or kept hearing weird things ever since, but none of that ever happens. They were arrested, and I never heard anything further. It's good to know that those men are in jail, or perhaps even dead, but what scares me is all the other people watching the live stream who were there for pleasure are still out there and there are probably thousands of other Culture 45s out there all over the world. If you're on the deep web, make damn sure you're as careful as possible. Story number three. This story happened when my girlfriend, Lindsay, resided in Tokyo, Japan for a teaching abroad occupation. She taught English to foreigners for a fairly decent pay. I personally wasn't too cultivated by the idea, as the thought of Lindsay being in a foreign country by herself really stressed me out. I can't wait for you to fly over, said Lindsay. Yeah, me too, babe. Hey, can you please make sure your doors are locked? I already locked it, silly. Stop being so paranoid. I know, I'm being paranoid. I just want you to be safe, okay? Don't worry. I am. Being away from Lindsay definitely took a toll on my health as I would constantly get anxious from worrying about her safety. Knowing that I didn't have the capability of protecting her from any unlawful perpetrators always gave me extreme anxiety, which is why my doctor prescribed an inhaler for me to use every time I felt the symptoms get out of hand. I didn't do too well with long-distance relationships, but I really wanted to support Lindsay in her career endeavors. I'd fly over there on occasion, usually around the holidays when work wasn't so strenuous for the both of us. I remember spending the majority of my time watching the rather odd Japanese game shows while Lindsay and her roommate, Mika, would do after hours work from home. Staying in Japan was quite the culture shock. I wasn't used to the Eastern lifestyle, but the longer I stayed there, the more accustomed I became, or I should say the more comfortable I felt with Lindsay staying there. Being halfway across the world made me adjust my sleeping schedule as I made it my duty to video chat Lindsay every day at exactly 3 a.m. in the morning. 3 a.m. over here was equivalent to 5 p.m. over there, according to the time zone difference. I'd make it a routine to catch Lindsay after her work shift was done, even if that cost me a few hours of sleep. You guys doing anything for Halloween? I said, Yep, Mika and I are probably going bar hopping. That sounds nice. I wish I could be there. We'll talk later, babe. Mika is calling me. Seeing that Lindsay had a roommate to acquaint herself with gave me a little peace of mind. A lot of my friends were well aware of how concerned I was about Lindsay's well-being, so much so that they would message me encouraging words to help cheer me up. But all of that changed. One night, when I got a message from one of my close colleagues from school, I opened the message and read, Hey, Craig. I know you're concerned about Lindsay, so I thought you might want to check this link out. It was a link to a forum titled as Teaching Abroad in Japan Safe. I hesitantly clicked the link, only to see the forum containing a large thread of positive comments saying stuff like teaching there was a great experience, highly recommended, or once you go to Japan, you'll never need another plan. Stuff like that. I then came across a user 
that posted a comment saying, for those who are considering being a tutor in Japan, you might want to watch this first before you fully commit with a link right next to it. I felt extremely skeptical clicking the link, but my curiosity was too overbearing to withstand my compulsion, so I clicked it. I then saw a low-grade video of a woman with her hands bound to the ceiling while being completely wrapped in duct tape. The woman was also wearing a plain white mask over her face with the word dog written on it. I couldn't tell if this was a joke or some sort of sick snuff film until I saw a man approaching the woman holding a large machete. I could hear this poor lady screaming in agony as he began to shout, what is your name? Please, sir, please, just let me go. Please, just let me go. What is your name? My name is Kathy, please. That's when I exited my web browser and instinctively video called Lindsay. It was about a quarter past three, the time I usually video called her. Why now? Come on, answer the video call, damn it. I assumed she was still at work, or possibly out with the roommates. So I waited patiently for a return call at her convenience. I decided to stroll around Instagram for another hour or so, until it was time to call it a night. I noticed Lindsay had posted a few pictures from the Halloween night out she had a couple of days ago. It looked like a huge costume festival of some sort on the streets of Japan. That's when I spotted a shocking revelation. In each of the photos presented, I saw a man wearing the same god mask as in the snuff film I'd seen earlier, nonchalantly masquerading in the background of the photos. He was in every photo, looking toward the direction of where the picture was being taken, or should I say the direction of where my girlfriend and her roommate were. That's when I got a video call from Lindsay. I unnervingly accepted it and saw what seemed to be Lindsay and her roommate. Mika, wearing white masks with the words Dog 1 and Dog 2 written on them. Why the hell are you guys wearing that? I want to play a game, said an ominous voice. Who the hell is that? I was beginning to panic. They both stood there silent, looking at the webcam, almost like my words didn't have any significant purpose to them. I then heard the man in the background saying transfer $20,000 to Dog 2's PayPal account right now, or else they both die. What the hell is going on? Please leave them alone, or I'll call the cops. So be it. Dog 2, take out Dog 1 now. Dude, please stop this. I'm begging you. I'll do anything you want. Just please don't hurt my girlfriend. Do it, Dog 2. Take out Dog 1 now, or else you're both getting taken out. The agitation in his tone was palpable. That's when Lindsay raised a large kitchen blade in the air and stabbed Mika in the neck. I could hear her gargling her own blood, while struggling to gasp for what seemed to be her last remaining breaths on Earth. That's when the voice in the background revealed himself, only to unveil the same man wearing the god mask that I'd seen in the snuff film and Instagram photos earlier. He then grabbed Lindsay by the forehead and raised a huge machete in the air, saying, transfer the money or else this dog gets put down too. Dude, please, I'm transferring the money right now. That's when I grabbed my phone and immediately began to transfer $20,000 to Lindsay's PayPal account. Here, look, I transfer $20,000 now. Now, please, can you let her go? I did everything you wanted. The man then approached the camera up close and began saying, I'm just a guy trying to survive in this cold, cold world. I just do what I have to do to put food on my family's table. You know, just know that God has nothing to do with this. What? What the hell? I began a request for another video chat, but there was no answer. That's when I got two messages from Lindsay's account. I clicked the chat box 
and saw an image of Lindsay's severed head on top of the computer desk. The other image was a mean face with the caption gotcha. Story number four. I used to sell organs on the dark web. No, I'm not a murderer. I work at a funeral home as its sole undertaker and owner. It's the only funeral home in the small town I live in. So I was pretty much the only choice for the families of the deceased to go to. I wasn't always the only worker there, though. The funeral home's a family business, so my father was the one who taught me the ins and outs of the trade as soon as I was old enough to. I tried to get out of it by going to medical school after university. I did pretty well for the three years I was there before I was forced to return to my hometown. My father had passed away from a sudden heart attack back home. He passed the funeral home down to me in his will. He also requested that I be the one to prepare his body for his funeral. Having to embalm his body was the single hardest thing I ever had to do, but I did it anyway because that's what he wanted. It was clear that the family business meant a lot to my father. The locals needed it too if they wanted a proper ceremony without having to drive miles to the next closest funeral home. Knowing that, I just couldn't abandon it anymore. It's not like I was going to be able to pay off the student loans, now that my father isn't around to help support me either. I had a choice. Either work, normally as an undertaker, and keep paying my student loans until it was my turn to be put in the ground, or find a little hustle on the side that might let me pay it off before I retire. The choice was obvious in my mind. The experience I got from medical school helped me carefully extract the organs from every corpse that found their way to my embalming table. The suits and dresses cover up the scars and a little bit of stuffing where the organs used to be kept them from looking deflated. Honestly, it wasn't too different from regular embalming. Their loved ones were none the wiser at their funerals. They often thanked me for making their family look alive one last time, not knowing that I had their organs stashed in a freezer in the back of the funeral home. For as much effort as we undertakers put into making bodies look pretty, our living clients tend to not look at them very closely in the end. So, hey, what they don't know won't hurt them, right? It's not like the corpses themselves can object to whatever I do to them either since they're, you know, dead. Considering some of the gruesome stuff regular embalmings entail, undertakers wouldn't exist if they could. Now, before any of you judge me for what I did, know this. As someone who has known doctors and wanted to become one in the past, the organs that people bury and burn every day are worth more than their weight in gold. There are people in hospitals waiting for life-saving organ transplants. And while their own time is running out, those whose time has already passed are taking their invaluable organs with them into the ground where they have no use for it. To me, burying something as precious as organs that could potentially keep more people from dying is just absurd. It's one of the reasons why I was so against inheriting the funeral home business in the first place, even more so than the morbid nature of the profession. That's not to say that I'm some sort of saint for thinking that way, though. After all, I was mainly selling organs to make money, not save lives. No legitimate doctor I know would ever try to find organs for their patients through the dark web anyways. I try my best to not ask what my customers intend to do with the organs I provide them. That used to be the case with one of my most frequent recurring customers. For the sake of the story, let's call him Harry. I met Harry when I was just starting out my organ selling business on the dark web. I had my own little website on the dark web where I conducted my business. Every time I extracted an organ from a corpse, I would list it on my website with a starting price that people could bid on. Once an organ was sold and paid for with Bitcoin, 
I'd drive to a secluded spot near the buyer's address, place down a container with the organs inside, and send the coordinates to the buyer before getting the hell out of Dodge. Harry was always a high bidder, and I very quickly got used to seeing his username on my dark website, offering exorbitant amounts of money for any organ I listed. He almost always won the bid, too. I don't know where the hell he got all the money to be spending on these organs, and I didn't care. I just wanted the money. One day, I had a complete set of organs up on sale on my dark website. Hearts, lungs, kidneys, you name it. The person I got them from had died from hypothermia. Apparently, he got drunk off his mind and spent the night asleep on the street where he froze to death. Terribly tragic incident, but it gave me the rare chance to harvest a full set of undamaged organs. Plus, him dying from the cold meant they were all still remarkably preserved by the time he reached my embalming table. The liver was a little worse for wear, though. Harry won the bid for several of the organs within just one day. I was able to make a crap ton of money, but I also had to haul a heavy icebox with a heart, a pair of lungs, two kidneys, and one nasty-ass liver across the state to the city he was in. I was really tired that day. Extracting that many organs without damaging them and stitching the body back up again isn't easy. That, coupled with the fact that I delivered organs to Harry about a dozen times before, made me complacent. I didn't notice the black car that was tailing me from behind until I was already in a secluded part of the city. When I noticed the car in my rearview mirror, I felt my pulse start to race. I'd always been afraid that something like this would happen. I thought that the police must finally caught on to what I've been doing. But before I panicked, I calmed myself down. It could just be a coincidence. A car that just so happened to be going in the same direction as me. I pulled my car to the side of the road under the pretense of checking my phone, hoping that they were just a regular car that'll just drive past. Instead, my heart leaped into my throat when the car pulled up beside me. This is it, I thought. They were the cops and are going to arrest me for selling organs on the dark web. But instead of arresting me on sight, the person in the black car rolled down their window. Inside was an average-looking man in a white dress shirt. I kept my window shut, still pretending to be on my phone when I got a text message on it. It was from Harry, and simply read, look beside you. I realized that the person beside me was my buyer. I was relieved that it wasn't the police, but I didn't want to show my face to a guy who buys organs on the deep web either. I made no move to open the door or roll down the window. I just texted him back, asking if he was the guy in the car beside me. He confirmed my suspicion and told me to roll down the window so that we could talk. I didn't budge. I just told him that we can discuss whatever he wants to discuss through text. I also asked him how the hell he knew where I was in the first place. He chuckled in his car when he read my message and texted back that he had his ways. He asked me how I got my organs, to which I replied that it was none of his concern. I saw him frown through his car's open window. Then he asked me if he could be there when I acquire the organs. I asked him why the hell he'd want that. His response remains with me to this day. He texted me that he always wanted to try making sashimi, and that the meat needed to be extra fresh for that. I realized with horror that all this time he's been buying the organs I sold to eat them. When I looked at him again through the closed car window, he was smiling in my direction with a toothy grin and wide, crazed eyes. I hit the gas and got the hell out of there as soon as possible. I also broke my phone and tossed its remains in a garbage can as soon as I could. Deep down, I always knew that it was possible that my customers could be eating the organs I gave them. There are a lot of sick people on the dark web. 
But there's a difference between knowing there are cannibals out there and coming face to face with one yourself. I no longer sell organs on the dark web. Instead, I encourage my living clients to willingly donate their loved ones' organs. Maybe by doing that, I can make up for all the disgusting things I've enabled on the dark web. This is The Curator. I hope you've enjoyed today's scary stories. Until next time.